All right, so um, in case you didn't see on the board, uh, I want to do a peer review at the end today, if there's time. Um, I'll try to leave time, but we'll see how that goes. I'm pretty bad at that. Um, and the reason is that I just want to go over the solution first, because I recognize that this is definitely a slightly harder homework than the past few. So I want to go over my solution. And actually, there's a couple of solutions that I want to go over. Each one kind of brings its own thing. So, um, first off, does anybody want to offer up their solution? Because I bet it's the same as my first solution. Mm -hmm. I just said uh, define the function, and then inside that, define um, a second one that takes. Uh, the R's and quarks, and then, um, and then at the bottom of the outer function, you return the one that you want. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the standard approach. Is you you have your outer function called specialize, and then that function defines an inner function, and that inner function ends up getting returned without being called. So that's exactly what I did. Um, I have my function called specialize. And then specialize has to take in the function that we're specializing, and then the R's that we're specializing it over. And the reason it's called specialize is that we're creating a new function, like a func, but that is designed, that is bound to these arguments ahead of time. So we've made a special version of this that is specifically for these arguments. So then the first thing we do is we make what we're going to return. What we're going to return is a new function, so we need to make a new function. So our new function also takes in star args and star star quars. One thing to note here is that I didn't mention this in the lecture, but you can name these parameters whatever you want. The important thing is that there's a star here, there's a two stars there. So here I call I use the naming convention that I use in lecture, but you can also call them anything. And the reason you have to call them different things here is that otherwise these parameters will um, mask the outer parameters. So inside of this function, we're going to want to have references to those parameters. But if we name them the same, then these parameters would override those parameters and lose those references. And then the magic happens when we just call func and combine the arguments. So this is how I did it. This is actually, when I was writing up the solution, this is what I googled and this is just the first thing I saw. I didn't know you could do this. So learn something new every day. I think uh, whether or not this syntax works is highly dependent on what version of Python you're running. Um, but I think it looks kind of cool. But I think you can also, at least definitely for the star args and star outer args, you actually don't need to combine them into a single tuple like this. You can just call func on star args, comma, star outer args, and it'll unpack both um, next to each other. So that's, that's OK. Um, for this homework, I didn't really care about the order that you combine these two things, but um, in the real world, you would care about the order because you want to make sure you preserve the order of the parameters. But for the examples that we were using, the order didn't matter, so that didn't matter. Questions? Mm -hmm. um, can you talk just a little bit about what star and star star do if you just use them in regular code, not in the function? So, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I didn't know you could do this until I looked it up this week. Because um, I, I know last lecture I mentioned, I think there was a question about what happens when you use star and star star outside of a function call or a function definition. And I said, it's not possible. Um, well, apparently it is possible. I just, I just didn't know about it. So um, I think in this context, what this means is that create a tuple, create a tuple where we unpack that thing and that thing into the tuple. And then that tuple then immediately gets re-unpacked. Um, so in this scenario, we're actually unpacking two tuples into a single tuple and then unpacking that tuple into a function call. So all of these stars refer to unpacking here. The packing occurs when we define our functions that take in these parameters. That packs multiple things into one thing. So we've got, we've got packing here, and we've got unpacking on unpacking here. Um, I don't know if it's always legal to use star or if it's only legal to do it inside of a uh, container comprehension like this. I don't know. I just looked it up and I thought it was cool. So, question. question? This is for homework, right? Yeah. I think you can do this in one line with Lambda. 
So, yeah, I'm get all... Wait, wait, with a lambda? Yeah. Like lambda out... Full R... Do you want to write it up on the board? Sure. There's a bunch of ways to solve this problem, so I'm going to it. Uh -huh. Why do you unpack them and then repack them and then unpack them again? Did you just put star arc, star outer arc, star star k arc, star So, yeah, I think, again, all of this stuff depends on what version you're on. Um, at least when I wrote this assignment on the version of Python I was on, you could do that with the tuples, you could do that with args, but you could not do that with the dictionaries for some reason. So you needed a way to explicitly combine these dictionaries. And the way that I looked up was unpacking them into a dictionary comprehension and then unpacking that dictionary comprehension. Um, but there's a ton of ways to do this. I think just unpacking them directly into the function call works now in newer versions of Python. But then there's also the explicit way of doing it where you just make a new dictionary and you loop through the two original dictionaries and you put everything from the original dictionaries into the new dictionary. So you can, there's all sorts of levels of, um, yeah, different, all sorts of different ways. But the trick is that you have to combine the arguments. So what we're doing here is we're specializing this function on these arguments by making a new function that combines those arguments with whatever new arguments we get when the function is actually called. So how's this one line lambda doing? Lambda So I think that's that's just a lambda version of this, right? Am I interpreting that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so um, since every single line of this function specialize is just kind of a one line, like this is just one return statement, and this specialized function is just one function definition. So because each one of these functions is just one operation, you could write it as a lambda expression, kind of like that. But um, that gets pretty hard to read. So I think this is a scenario where it would, that, it would, it's better to just write it out. But yeah, certainly that works. Other questions about this? OK, so this is my first solution. But then I was thinking about how the last slide in the last lecture, I mentioned that closures and objects are kind of the same thing, right? Because a closure connects some data from its enclosing scope to a function. And functionality and data, when combined, that's also kind of like what we do when we make an object. We have some functionality and some data combined. So I started thinking, I wonder if I could write this as an object. And you actually totally can. So here is another way to write the exact same code. We're going to write a class. And the init for that class, which is what gets called when we call a class, takes in the function and the arguments. And we save everything. And then we define a call. And then we do what we did in the inner function. So this is kind of a demonstration of how closures and objects are really the same thing. By defining an init and a call, we're doing effectively the same thing as defining an outer function, which returns an inner function. Um, so which version is better here is kind of um, is kind of dependent on the exact scenario. But I think this is actually pretty nice. This is pretty clean. A good sign of good code is that it's not very nested. And so here, everything is just nested two levels. We've got the class level and then the function level. We don't have this confusing function definition inside function definition thing. So this, I think this is a pretty nice solution. But it's not what I expected. I expected the, um, the function within function things just because that's what we talked about. But both of these work. So whichever, whichever, uh, whichever you did is totally fine if you did either of these at all. There's actually a third way to solve it, though. And this is my favorite by far. And I think, um, yeah, totally kudos to anybody who did it this third way. So specialize, the function that I call specialize is actually already built into Python. And it's called partial. And it's in a module called func tools. And so the, the, the shortest solution is to just import that function and call it specialize. So this is also totally valid. And so the meta, the meta lesson here is that um, 
Python has a bunch of stuff built in. So if you find yourself building kind of like low-level tools that combine functions or like low-level combinations, a lot of those patterns are built into Python in some module and then you can just import it. Questions about this? So one thing is, because Python is open source, you can just look up um, this module here, Funk Tools. Funk Tools conveniently is written in Python, so it's very readable. And then you can find this function definition partial. And it turns out, actually, that the way Python, C Python, implements partial is the class way. So if you look up the source code, it actually looks very similar to this. This is actually almost exactly the same as the Python implementation of partial. And um, so, and th there's a little bit of extra stuff here because, like I said, I didn't really care about the order of parameters here, but Python's partial function does a little bit more checking to make sure that you're specializing functions and not declaring an argument twice or that kind of thing. So, just a kind of fun fact. Uh, the partial function is super useful. I personally use partial a, a fair bit, and it's going to come back at the end of this lecture. Um, so just keep that in mind. Partial equals specialize, and um, you've already written that. Questions about the homework? Okay. So today we're going to talk about decorators. And decorators is actually a pretty easy topic after having covered closures. Because decorators, for the most part, are just a special form of closure. Usually, in, in that very gray text there. And the, the caveat there is that you could define a, a, a decorator that isn't a closure, but if you define a decorator that isn't a closure, it's probably pretty useless. But it's technically possible. But we'll, we'll see that in just a second. So here is the kind of prototypical decorator. You define a function, it takes in a function, do some stuff, and then we define a wrapper, takes in anything, and that wrapper <coughs> then calls the function, and then we return the wrapper. So this should look like a pretty familiar um, pattern, because it's very similar to the specialized function that you just wrote. The difference being that here, this function has to only take in function. So specialized took in the function and some things to specialize on, but the decorator just takes in the thing you're decorating. So this is it. This is a decorator. That's the whole pattern. Now it turns out that by limiting the closure that we're writing here, first of all, what is the closure that's being closed? Anybody else? Uh, funk. Yeah, funk is a closure here because funk is defined in this outer scope, and then we're using it in the inner scope. And then we return the wrapper, so the, this scope goes away, but we still have a reference to wrapper, which references that thing from that scope. So that's the closure here. The closure is funk. Funk gets closed. So by limiting the closure to this specific pattern, where our decorator only takes in the thing that we're decorating, we get some cool perks. So here's an example of a decorator. We're going to call it debug, takes in a func. We're going to print that we're decorating this function. And then we're going to define our wrapper, takes in anything. Then we're going to print that this function just got called on these arguments. And then return the result of calling that original function. So again, this is pretty similar to the homework. We're writing a wrapper, and the wrapper calls func. Func is the closure. And then we return the wrapper. So now if we define this function foo, it doesn't matter what it does. The thing that we're going to do with foo is decorate it. So it doesn't matter what we actually put here. We just are curious about what's going to happen. So we've got foo. We call one, two, three. We get uh, nothing. Nothing happens, kind of like we expect. Now to apply the decorator, we call debug on the function. And then here we've called the debug on the function and then set it back to the original function. 
So what we've done is we've actually lost a reference to the original function foo here. Foo is not, this foo is gone. Instead, we've replaced foo with the decorated version of foo. And so now, here before, when we called foo, nothing happened. Hard to debug, right? We don't know what happened. Maybe it worked, maybe it didn't work. But now that we've decorated foo with debug, First off, as soon as we call debug, we get decorated, right? Because that was the first line of debug. We called this function, and this function prints that thing, and so we print that thing. But now if we call foo, it prints out that it just got called on that thing, on, on those arguments. So this is just a simple debug decorator that can be used to see what's happening in your code. Make sense so far? There's nothing out of the ordinary here except for what we covered last time. This is just a closure. It's just a closure, closure in a specific form. And then we apply that specific form by calling the closure, the decorator on the thing, but then assigning it back to the original. <coughs> nothing crazy. What's going to happen if we decorate print? Anybody know? Any guesses? Uh, uh -huh. Too much recursion? Yes. Yeah, recursion error? Yeah. 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 So I, I remember last week we were talking about the, um, what was it, the esoteric print function, where you had to override print. But then if you used print in your new print function, then you would get a recursion error. Same thing is going to happen here. We called print in our decorator two places. So if we now try to decorate print, we're assigning print to a function that calls print. So we're actually introducing recursion here without really knowing it. And so sure enough, it works for now, but then as soon as we try to print, recursion error. So you still have to watch out for the same pitfalls that are possible with regular closures. It's just here, uh, it's even more hidden because the way we're applying these decorators is by replacing the original function. So you would never know that um, we've actually created recursion here, unless you knew exactly how debug was implemented. So it's so a little bit of a pitfall. In practice, it doesn't really happen that much, because usually the decorator doesn't call the functions that you're trying to decorate with it. It's just print is kind of a special case. <coughs> Questions about this? Mm -hmm. Could you decorate operators? Decorate operators. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give me an example of an operator? Uh, like less than, plus, less than. So, less than, what happens when you type out you know, A less than B is you're actually writing a function call, A dot dunder LT B. And so you can't decorate the operator, but you could decorate, decorate that function, that method that's actually being called when you use less than. So, you can apply decorators to any function, and um, and so that's yeah, you can do it there. But you can't do it directly to the operator. Yeah, good question. Other questions? Okay. So, the way we apply the decorator was by calling the function on the thing we're trying to decorate, and then assigning that back to the thing. That's kind of weird, right? Like, if we hadn't just gone over first class functions and closures, then if you were reading for a code base and you saw all this, like, what does that mean? That's always a confusing line to encounter because you have to know exactly what's going on. You have to know what decorator does. You have to know the type of foo. It just gets confusing. And so it turns out that Python, because this is a nice pattern, the decorator pattern ends up being useful, because it's useful, Python gives us some special syntax for it. So instead of just calling the function, we can actually use the at symbol. <coughs> so now if we say at debug, we can define a function. And then you can see, just as we finish defining the function, our decorator gets called. We know that because that was the first line of the debug decorator. The first thing we did was print out that we're decorating something. So now immediately after defining this function, our decorator gets called. And now, if we call bar, it's already decorated with, with our debug decorator. <coughs> this is nice for many reasons. I mean, for one, we don't have to look at this kind of weird first-class function stuff anymore. 
And another thing is, we actually get to see the intention of decorating this function as we're defining it. You know, because usually when you're defining a function and you want to decorate it, you know that ahead of time. So we get to say that we're decorating this thing as we're defining it. And then that decoration happens right away. So there's never a moment here where bar is undecorated. You never have to worry about, you know, oh, is this before we've done that? No, it happens as soon as the function is defined. So this is definitely better in a lot of ways. And it's really just syntactic sugar around placing this line right after the function definition. Questions about that? Mm-hmm. Um, where does your decorator have to be defined with respect to the function you're trying to decorate? Good question. So, debug was just a function, right? Debug was just a function that took in a function. And so the rules for where that decorator has to be is the same rules for where a function has to be for you to call that function. So, like, if debug is defined in this same file, then we're good. Otherwise, you have to import it just like any other function. Other questions? Mm-hmm. So you have to write a decorator method to call debug. To write a decorator method to call debug. You have to, you mean you have to like write something to be decorated? No, you have to, is the decorator thing not built in? The, the at? Like the syntax so, here? Or like the function debug? The, the thing, the decorator function. Decorator function. The function is just what we defined on the previous slide. So, oh, okay. so, so yeah. you have to write that before. Yeah, yeah. The, the decorator itself is that function that takes in a function and returns a function. And it's just Python gives us some special syntax for calling that function in this very specific way. Okay. So we, we wrote that function to be used as a decorator, and so we can use the decorator way of calling function in a regular way. Yeah. Other questions about this? Mm-hmm. Um, what are, are there any big built-in libraries of decorators? Oh, yeah. Um, there's no single library for decorators, really, in Python, but you'll find them all throughout. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like an example of a decorator that I think is built-in is a decorator that allows you to use any context manager as a decorator. So. Like, what's an example of a context manager? Context manager is when you use the with statement in Python. So, if you say, like, with open and then some file name as file, and then you put some code in here, you're using a context manager, and what that's going to do is it's going to make sure that when you exit this with block, it'll close the file for you. So that's what a context manager is. And this is pretty nice because it means we don't have to worry about closing that file. There's a decorator in Python that lets you use this instead of as being a context manager, it allows you to use it as a decorator, I'm pretty sure. So instead of writing that, if you knew that for a certain function, you need to have... If you know that for a certain function, you know... You need, in here, you need a certain file to be open. You could say, like, at um, context manager as decorator, and then you pass in the context manager that you want to use. File. So that's a decorator that allows you to use the open statement instead of as being a context manager as a decorator for a whole function. So now everything in this function will have this file open and it'll automatically be closed when the function is returned. So that's an example of a decorator that's built in. That's just the first thing that comes to mind. But there's simpler ones. Um, but I don't remember what module that's in. They're not all centralized in one module. They're kind of spread throughout. Yeah, big question. There. Other questions? Mm-hmm. So that at syntax, that takes in, I'm assuming, a function that you put it above, I guess, implicitly, but then you, can you pass other arguments to it like that? Great question. Yeah, I will get to that in a couple slides. Yeah, so this is, 
This should look weird to you because here we're, we're just putting this function name here, and that function debug, debug is a function, function gets called on whatever we put after it. But here, what is this? Like, this is a function name, but like, whoa. this isn't a function name, this is a function call being used as a decorator. So that is confusing. There's a whole slide on that later. Yeah. Other questions? You said that the decorator is calling everything after. You see, like, ask debug, can you, like, stop the debug from being called my decorator functions? Oh, oh, it's only the immediately proceed. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So it's not okay. like any other functions that we find here will also be eaten, but it's just whatever whatever you put as next line. Mm -hmm. Does that have something to do with, like, there being con after 10, whereas in the first decorator we wrote, we, like, didn't get a con after the last argument? Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, that's actually a great question. It has nothing to do with decorators. That's a syntax thing in Python. Um, if, you, if you have a tuple in Python with one element, Python will always print it and expect it to be written as parentheses, thing, comma. You have to include a trailing comma for a single element tuples, because otherwise Python can't tell the difference between this and just a parenthesized expression. So, fun fact. Another fun fact, now that we're on this article, one of the most annoying bugs of like 2019, for me personally, was that it turns out in Python, you can exclude the parentheses here, and Python will still interpret this as a tuple of one element. Which means that if you actually have like some function call in here, like foo on some parameters, and then a trailing comma on accident, this doesn't return the function call foo, it returns the tuple containing the return value of <laughs> And geez, that, wow, that's a wicked bug. So, yeah, trailing commas for single element tuples, that's a rabbit hole and a half. How did you figure that out? How? Uh, How long did it take you? That was like a day. That was like a day, yeah. This is all my code just stopped working all of a sudden. And the error was like, um, it was extra confusing because not only was there this trailing comma here that made this whole thing a tuple, but then the return value of foo was like also a triple nested tuple. <laughs> so it was like, I was looking at the output and it like matched exactly what I expected. The problem was just that there was an extra parenthesis on either side because the whole thing was wrapped in one tuple. So, yeah. Triggered. <laughs> Okay, other questions about this? Great questions. Mm -hmm. So anybody D decorate? A D decorate? Yes. Great question. <laughs> you would have to know the decorator. You can D decorate, but you would have to know how the decorator is implemented, and then you'd have to use something called reflection in order to be able to decorate it. And we'll get to that later. Yeah. Other questions? So, okay, this is the slide um, about the question earlier. What if we want to have parameterized decoration? Like we want to decorate something, but we want to like have the way that it gets decorated dependent on some parameter that we passed in. Well, we can do that, as we saw right here. Here's another example. Like maybe we want to debug, but who here has you know added a bunch of print statements to their code, and then you get lost in the print statements because you just print out the same thing like here, 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 here. I mean, it's flooded with here, right? And then you want to add a new print statement, but you want to be able to search for it. So you add star, star, star to the beginning of that print statement. So then in the output, you see the star, 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 and you're like, ah, now I'm really here. I do that all the time. And so, like, maybe we want to support that. <laughs> so this debug decorator takes in a prefix, and it's going to print that prefix before it prints anything. So now, when we decorate bar, if we call bar, Bars called all those things, stop, stop, stop. So, probably not a good thing to support, but you know, let's say we want to do it. How would we write that? Well, the intuition here comes from the fact that before, let's see, before, when we used our decorator, we said at debug. It turns out that Python is actually evaluating this thing. It, it evaluates whatever we put after the at sign, and it expects to find a decorating function, a function that can be used as a decorator. 
And so here, conveniently, we defined debug to be a function that decorates. But if we want to pass something into the decorator like that, then all of a sudden we have a set of parentheses here, which means that this thing is now getting evaluated as a function call. This function will now be called on those arguments and then must evaluate to a decorator. And so you might be able to guess what's going to happen here. We're going to need a function with an inner function with an inner function. Because now we call this function, and this function should return a decorator. So here's our decorator. This function should return the wrapper. So here's the wrapper. So we now have triple nested closures. And there really is a closure here because prefix gets referenced here, func gets referenced here. And so our star star quarks gets referenced here. So at every level here, there's, there really is a closure. Mm -hmm. So why didn't they just make it so that you add additional parameters after fuck? Uh, because that would have been a little bit um, disingenuous. I mean, it's, uh, in, a, in a certain way, it's nice that we can count on this thing just being evaluated. And it has to evaluate to a function that's a decorator. Okay. So it's, it's more consistent at the end of the day, from a parsing standpoint, to just um, force whoever's writing the decorator to do this. And the thing is, if you're writing a decorator, you must be comfortable with closures. Yeah. And so, <coughs> I, I guess the cost is just not that high. Yeah. Good question, though. Mm -hmm. Does debug prefix have to return debug? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so everybody see what happens here? Debug prefix, instead of now just being a function that's a decorator, it's a function call that should return a decorator. So the debug prefix is a function that returns our decorator. Our decorator wraps the function and returns the wrapper, and the wrapper calls the function. Questions about this? Mm -hmm. So the at symbol doesn't actually have anything necessarily to do with the decorator. Because in this case right now it's just a function that you're calling with the at. So that's exactly why I put on the earlier slide that decorators are all closures, usually. Because you can put whatever you want after that at symbol. And it could decorate or refuse to decorate. You could write a decorator that just always outputs like foo. So whatever you decorate, it just, you know, just throws it away. So, so yeah, you can put anything you want there. And if you, did, if you did do that, then you wouldn't need an inner function. You wouldn't need a closure. So, yeah. And I think you don't even have to output something of the same type. And so like, you could write a, a decorator here that just returns one. And then any function that you decorate with that decorator would then just turn into one. Bar would be one. <laughs> but again, like I said, if, you're, if you find that your decorator isn't a closure, it's probably pretty useless, and that's a prime example. Yeah. Other questions about this? Okay. So if we can decorate functions, functions are just things that we can call, right? And we can call classes too, can't we? What happens when we call a class? We construct an instance. So if we can decorate functions, we can probably decorate classes, and it turns out we can. So here's an example of the use case that we want to support here. We want to debug, instead of a function, we want to debug a whole class. So we put our de decorator there. Now, instead of defining a function, we define a class. And our class has some methods, and then we decorate that class, and when we create an instance and call the method, the method debugs. So how would we write that? Well, we can write it exactly the same way we wrote our other decorators. We've got our decorator, takes in a class this time, not a function, and then since this time we have to return a class, the very first thing we're going to do is instead of defining a function, we're going to define an inner class. And it also turns out that when you define a class, we're used to whatever you put here being the superclasses, right? Just like with a function call, you can unpack, you can unpack a tuple into a class definition, and these will be interpreted as base classes. So here we are, we're making a class that inherits from exactly the same things that CLS inherits from. And then we're going to pass temporarily. We're not going to define anything in that function, or inside of that class. 
And then now we're going to do some crazy meta stuff and populate the, the class with everything in CLS but debugged. So don't stress about understanding this line because this is reflection and we'll get to that in a couple weeks. But it turns out to be very useful in this case because a class is kind of more complicated than a function. So in order to properly wrap this class, we kind of need to do some reflection here. So just excuse the, the jump in time here. But if you just take this reflection for granted, you can see that we're populating the wrapper class with everything but debugged. And debug here in this case is the decorator that we defined earlier. So we've been using debug as a decorator, but it's still just a function that takes in a function and returns a function. So we can also just call it straight up. So here we are calling our decorator straight up and passing the result of that decoration into the class. And then we return the record. And this works how we expect. Questions about this? Again, sorry for the reflection, but it's just kind of hard to avoid. So you have all written a decorator. The specializer function is so close to the decorator requirement that it can be used as a decorator. Right? Specialized took in func and then star args, star star quarks. Star args and star star quarks can be empty, which means that you could call specialize on just a function, which is the requirement for being a decorator. So I'm going to import partial again. Again, partial is the same thing as specialized. And now I can say at partial, and we can define a function. Uh, does anybody know what's going to get printed here? Are we going to print anything? Is it going to be an error? Thoughts? Should it just be just six? Yeah, normal call two. Yeah, I agree. So partial, partial takes in a function and then some arguments to bind to that function. But here, this usage of partial, we just passed in the function that immediately comes after the decorator. So here, we passed in the function, but no arguments, so nothing got back. So foo is foo, foo remains foo. So when we call foo on one, two, three, exactly what we expect happens. So we can use partial as a decorator, but it wasn't that useful, right? Because we didn't actually bind anything. What if we wanted to use partial to bind something to a function at decoration time? Though? What if we wanted to do that? How could we do it? Well, it might be really nice if we could say something like at partial and then some things that we want to bind. Maybe we want to bind C to 10. That'd be pretty nice, but it wouldn't work. Because partial, again, when you, when you parameterize a decoration like this, this gets evaluated. But partial expects the first thing to be func. So here we didn't pass in a func, so this would break. Partial expects the first thing to be a func. So does anybody have an idea of how we could get this to work, how we could use partial to bind an argument at decoration time? Define a function? Like define yeah. Function. Yeah, that could, that could probably work. Yeah, that would definitely work. Mm -hmm. Other ideas? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do something after the function definition. Do something after the function. That is also true, but the whole idea with decorators is that we do it all as we're defining the function. Like, yeah. Any other ideas? Uh -huh. Could you put the definition of foo into parentheses next to partial? No, because we haven't defined foo yet. Right? The definition of foo is what's coming after our decorator expression, right? So we, have, we don't have that yet. These are all great thoughts. Mm -hmm. Can you like, stack decorators? Like, can you do another at something? You can stack decorators, but I don't think that would help here. So here's, here's my solution. <laughs> So here what we're doing is we're specializing the specializer 
partially partial <laughs> on c equals 10. And so now what this is going to evaluate to, what does this do? I mean, like, this is just a function call. We're going to specialize partial on c equals 10. So now this is going to evaluate to a partial that always tries to bind c to 10. <laughs> and so now this will work, just like before, because it's still just partial. I mean, we just wrapped partial. We just made it so that this partial always binds c to 10, always binds c to 10. So now, this will still work, but if we call foo on just 1 and 2, we still get an answer. It's kind of hard to parse, <clears throat> but you can, you can decorate your, yourself. You can, you can call yourself on yourself. So, so partial here, we're, 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 spec we're partially partial on c equals 10. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Should it just like exceed the recursion depth? No, nope, there's no recursion error going on here. Um, we're just creating, I mean, you can... The recursion error happened because we were decorating print, but then the wrapper function called print. But here, we're, we're, we're partialing partial, but the wrapper function that partial creates doesn't call partial. So, and we're not using this to decorate partial itself. We're not assigning partial to anything. We're just using partial to decorate itself. But we haven't changed what partial is. So this, yeah, this is safe. So we're first here. All right. So the reason that you're not the reason that it doesn't override what partial is is that you're not assigning anything to that result. Yeah. Now, yeah. If we had said now like. Um, If we had said like partial equals partial partial dot, you know, then that maybe maybe with that would throw over to Unsure though. I think it would actually work. Okay. What about this line? What is what is? <laughs> partial, partial, partial. So I'll leave this as an exercise to the readers. Because it turns out you can figure out what this is, and it actually, from a theoretical standpoint, this expression is quite interesting. And what it evaluates to is actually kind of crazy. Um, it turns out that this evaluates to something that could be considered a compiler compiler. What? Is it just a function still? <laughs> it's still just a function, but if you were to. Oh, no, it depends, like, so I guess, like, what is plus equals in a function into arguments? Uh, I don't know what you mean by that. But so, what, I don't want to get hung up on this. This is really an exercise for the reader, if you want. But this will come back in the lecture on language metaprogramming where it turns out that that thing ends up being quite powerful, powerful, more powerful than you might think. So, why is this metaprogramming, right? We've been kind of building our way up to decorators for a while. We did first class functions, and then we did closures, and now we're on decorators. Well, if you think of a function as code, right? A function is code. A function is a script. It's a procedure. Then writing functions that take in functions and output functions is totally meta. Right, because especially when you're actually doing some non-trivial changes to those functions. So all of the decorators we wrote today actually did something kind of interesting, and that's metaprogramming. And it turns out that decorators, in reality, are very useful for something called aspect-oriented programming. And that's where you try to separate cross-cutting concerns from vertical concerns. So here, you know, like, um, you know, maybe we're in the messaging app and we want to do some logging. But also here, maybe, like, this is YouTube, and YouTube also wants to do some logging. And we want all the logging to be uniform. Then it turns out to be really nice to separate cross kind of concerns into decorators so that your business logic can just be a regular function, but the, the things that apply to everything are outside of the function, but still applicable all over the place. <coughs> The way I kind of think of decorators, I think of decorators as like superclasses for functions. 
It's a way to make your function do something it didn't do by itself. You can make your function inherit from some function template outside of yourself. And now that's a little confusing of an analogy because again, decorators can be used for classes and so decorators are actually more powerful than inheritance. But it's kind of a similar concept. It's a way of copying code into your, your children, so to speak. Okay, so that's that's end of my slides. I have, I you know, I liked I like showing real examples of things, and so I'm going to go back to our capstone project. Again, sorry for the capstone team, <laughs> but so this is this is a closure that I wrote, um, but it's not a super interesting closure because it doesn't return the wrapper function. So it turns out I kind of made it sound like a closure. You write an inner function that references your enclosing scope, and then you return that function. You actually don't have to return it. Any inner scope that references the outer scope is technically a closure. So here, this inner function is excluded. It only takes in data of month, but then it references recurrence, and recurrence is defined in the outer scope. And so this is technically a closure. And the reason that I did it is just because I didn't want to have to pass in recurrence every time I call is excluded. Is excluded ends up being called several times, and it would be kind of redundant to pass in the recurrence that we're dealing with every single time. So this is an example of where using a closure is just kind of clean because it prevents repetitive uh, method, uh, argument passing. So here's an example of a closure. Here's an example of a decorator that I wrote. Um, this decorator is called PDFU, and it takes in a function. And then one thing you might note here is that this inner function ends up getting uh, decorated. So you can use a decorator on any function definition that, that includes inner function definitions. And it's standard practice in the real world when you're using a decorator to always wrap your wrapper function in the decorator to wrap the function. And what that does is it, it sets up some Python things in the back end to, so that this wrapper function ends up getting identified as the original function at decoration time. So, like uh, an unfortunate side effect of decorators is that after decorating something, like, like let's say we at debug foo. Well, you define the function and then here it gets decorated. And then here, if we actually were to inspect foo, like foo dot under name, we would get the name of the wrapper function implemented in debug. That's not so nice because we think of foo as just being foo. And so this meta wrapper decorator sets up all the names and stuff and so that so that it looks like how we expect it when we print things out. Otherwise, this is just a basic decorator. The wrapper function assumes that the output of func is some HTML and then it renders that HTML into a PDF and returns the PDF instead. And so this, this decorator is used to output PDFs from our project. And one cool thing about decorators is that you can um, concatenate them. So like every single endpoint on in this file, we want to output a PDF, but we also want to restrict it to only staff. So regular users can't generate these PDFs. So it turns out there's a decorator for requiring staff membership, and then there's also a decorator that I just wrote for PDF views you can combine them. And so this is an example of um, kind of the nice um, composability that you get from decorators. So, so in what order is that? Oh, uh, great question. I was going to look up the order, and I always forget the order. It's never the order I think it is. I think it's in reverse order. And it, it applies them in a very weird order, and that ends up causing bugs. So yeah, good question. All right, I'm out of time, so thanks for sticking with me. Uh, please do your peer reviews by midnight. I know I didn't give you time in class, so if you don't get a chance, that's okay. But, you know, it's, if you're feeling bored over dinner, watching The Office, you know, whatever, log on to your computer. You think it's Thanks. Oh, shoot, I forgot. All right. We're all here.